food sovereignty activists living in what is known as Portland, Oregon. Um, what I am currently working on are projects that are uh, around uh, culturally specific food boxes for our, for our Pacific Islander community, which expands not only from uh, Polynesian community, but also the larger um, Micronesian community. Um, a little bit back myself. I'm also a member of PCW, uh, our Portland chap chapter, so Pacific Climate Warriors. And I am also a student in environmental engineering uh, with hopes of working to uh, do water filtration and renewable energy in French Polynesia, which is where my family is originally from. Um, should I begin with uh, my talk then? Um, yeah, feel free to begin and talk now. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, Yorana and Maeva to everyone. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that today is Native American Heritage Day in the United States. And I would like to recognize the indigenous peoples and their native lands that I, as a settler, currently live, garden, and forage on. I must express endless gratitude to the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Wasco, Kalapuya, Cowlitz, as well as the countless other nations who live here past, present, and future. We must recognize that land, food, culture, and identity are all intertwined, and that this link was disrupted when it was stolen through violence, forced displacement, cultural erasure, and the perpetual unrecognized sovereignty of these nations in what we now call the Americas. It is our responsibility as settlers to stand with indigenous people's claims to sovereignty. We must join them in solidarity when they call for land back, and we must build and maintain meaningful relationships and cultural exchange with these nations. I must also express gratitude to Black Americans whose influence helped define our culture, development, and economic growth of this country, as well as the many other former colonies of the Global North. This was also made through the labor and ins of enslaved Africans and their ascendants who suffered from the horrors of the transatlantic trafficking, chattel slavery, and state enforced segregation. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence, which, was, which has reverberated through the generations and is still felt and witnessed today. We must also stand in support when they make calls for reparations and true equality. Moving beyond the land acknowledgement, I would like to ask that everyone reflect on what actions we can do that actively center reparations and or material support for black and indigenous peoples, as well as supporting the land that we live, work, garden, and forage on. I grew up in the occupied kingdom of Hawaii. I was a very fussy eater and quite the vegetable phobic child. My stomach and heart were only set on things like spam, loco moco, hamburgers, and chicken nuggets. If it was anything green or grown from the ground, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. After my parents split, my food palette and food choices became more heavily shaped by these fast foods, which had now had become our everyday staples. They were the most readily available foods I had access to since my mother and I had worked at a fast food establishment. Now, I don't blame her at all for this, the decisions he made. She had to make some really hard choices to ensure that my sister and I were fed, and this was often the lowest cost to freeway she could feed us. Being an immigrant, lacking a formal degree, she was only afforded entry to mid-level unskilled positions, which further put her at a disadvantage in an already difficult situation. My mother had hoped by, that by raising us under American occupation, that would we be given a better chance at success than what she was afforded under French colonial rule in Moorea. In many ways, she wanted us to embrace being American. What is more American than a steady diet of hamburgers and chicken nuggets? Though we had roots in our Tahitian culture and community, that connection seemed to drift further and further away as she began to work longer and longer hours. As I grew into a rowdy teenager, I started flirting with punk, anarcho, and DIY ideology. At first, because I wanted to be 
the cool Tahitian punk rock guy. But as I became more entrenched in these philosophies, I began to start connecting the dots. I began to see colonial mentality more vividly. And it led to me aligning with the Kanaka Maoli, the native Hawaiians, and their liberation movement. Because liberation movements are possibly the most punk rock thing you could get into. This is where I first became acquainted with Pacifica food sovereignty and how it is an essential part in understanding who we are and that the system is rooted in social justice. Our traditional foods aren't just something that we've thrown together because we wanted to eat it. Our traditional foods are our topuna, our elders. Thus, it is our responsibility to tend and foster our relationship with them, much in the way our topuna nourish and care for us. I would see this sort of support every time there was an organized action. Kanaka and allies supporting the community through direct actions such as making and bringing food to those who were disadvantaged or lacked access to our ancestral foods. So when I arrived, uh, when I arrived on Turtle Island, I became exposed to the idea of permaculture, which I saw as having many parallels to our native food systems. Permaculture attempted to mimic nature, integrating all sorts of useful plants, allowing you to harvest food, medicine, and material through sustainable means. I got really excited to be a part of this ever-growing community of urban gardeners who were really into self-sufficiency, which sounded pretty great, right? But as time wore on, it became particularly clear that many uh, permaculture practitioners I was meeting were disproportionately white, often practicing techniques that were a kitchen sink cocktail of piecemeal indigenous techniques from around the world. What was most clear was that these techniques were far from removed from their distinct cultural context and often tethered to a story weaving the image of an indigenous per people stuck frozen in some mythic past, effectively extinct. What I also noticed was that these practitioners would often move into areas that are historically black and brown communities. Many of these communities had been considered blighted by the city of Portland. There were vast food deserts due to racist redlining policies, and they lacked many of the basic social services to make a thriving, healthy community. These permaculture practitioners were also very in insular almost exclusively working with other white transplants instead of reaching out to help raise up their surrounding communities. Through a thousand rote micro infractions, they were inadvertently accelerating gentrification in their search to find personal food security. So as these neighborhoods shifted into more desirable green oasis, the founding communities were being priced out left and right. In many ways, these actions were more akin to green colonialism than anything else. This is where I think permaculture can fail as a system. By ignoring the most important tenets that our Pacifica indigenous cultures share, culturally appropriate approaches and social equity. So for us who do recognize what we need, uh, that we need equitable access and action, should we just stop using the term permaculture altogether? Renaming something without putting it in the necessary work, putting in the necessary work is not enough to undo the damage perpetuated by well-meaning liberal colonialism. We must actively challenge and ultimately break down our settler colonial mentality and behavior. Simply put, doing the former and not the latter does not help indigenous immigrant or historically BIPOC communities. So what are we to do to better support these communities. We as the diaspora must understand that as settlers occupying in indigenous lands, it is imperative that we actively learn from and elevate those who also work in dismantling the pervasive na narrative of dead and gone peoples. We must especially support those who, whose work is reconnecting the youth in the preservation of their traditional knowledge. Simple ways in which we can help further support their causes are through direct volunteering with indigenous managed land restoration, community advocacy, or through material means. I think we must also abandon the mythology of self-sufficiency alone can save us. 
this thought process is extremely individual centered. And sometimes it's surprising how prevalent it is in digital permaculture spaces. Instead, we should work towards a more holistic approach that centers community building, better food access, culturally specific food distribution to ensure that our communities can stay connected to who they are. I feel very privileged to be a part of this new wave of food activism in the Pacific Northwest. As I never thought I would see mobilization of so many different communities from all backgrounds, Black, Indigenous, Pacifica, immigrant, and refugee. These community members are doing amazing work and it's so inspiring to see their projects blossom. Acquiring garden plots that are used to grow culturally specific foods, plant starts and seed saving for their community, and the countless other ways of outreach and resource distribution. Currently, I am also in the process of creating my own culturally specific food, food box program with the help of the Oregon Food Bank. It is our hope to be able to provide 40 Pacifica families a month for the next year with culturally specific foods, vegetable starts and seeds, and how to grow them in a temperate cli climate. I'm also planning to set up a community free fridge where uh, donated produce can be accessible to anyone who needs it. And hopefully one day, a community garden that we can help cultivate our food. Finally, we must flip the narrative by reclaiming our systems of knowledge and the cultural importance of our food. Maybe through origin stories, oral history, or creative expression. We must embrace the words of our people, which helps us better describe how we manage Te Whenua, our land. It means recognizing that our culture has, has been and will be continuous. It means taking back our cultural systems as there is no separation between our land, food, culture, and ourselves. It may be the Ahokua systems practiced by the Kanaka Maoli, or for my ancestry is the Tata Mohi, the Va Maitaina, which similarly treats our valleys as our va'a, and it is our duty for us to always keep our va'a going. I must give great praise to people like my sister who are working to reestablish these practices for the youth in Mo'orea. She has also been recording the many languages and wisdoms of our tapuna, who are scattered across Moana Nui, each with their distinct cultural approach to managing te whenua on their islands. I still have so much to learn from our tapuna, from our mana'o, and I want to stress that there should never be shame cast on those who are unfamiliar or who are just becoming reacquainted with their culture. We are all descendants of those who survived colonialism. Our ancestors had to adapt in the face of countless atrocities committed against them. Yet, we are still here, and so is our knowledge. It is our responsibility to ensure that our ways will continue to be carried on by our future generations to come. Mauru.